Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our weekly Kaffee Pause. Our guest today is Brent Goff. He is chief anchor at Deutsche Welle News and host of The Day with Brent Goff. Brent, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be with you. I am really happy to see you. I feel like it's been been way too long since you and I have been in touch. So I'm I'm very happy that we're able to to have this conversation today. And indeed, it is another um, big news day, if you will, and and we have a lot to talk about. And there are undoubtedly a lot of different things um, that we can that we could start with. But I thought we should start with the EU foreign minister meeting in in Luxembourg today, um, partly because the foreign ministers are yet again taking on the thorny issue of sanctions. And while many officials believe that a curb on Russian oil is imminent, the decision needs to be um, unanimous by all EU member states. And one proposal which is under consideration according to some diplomats is some kind of a tariff on Russian oil, Um, but there are some sharp divisions between the, the various countries. Ursula von der Leyen has has stated that the EU is now thinking about a system of of so-called rolling sanctions. Um, Both she and Josep Borrell have indicated that an embargo will come soon. Um, Charles Michel is supporting more sanctions. Um, How is this debate uh, over, um, over sanctions, over an embargo, playing out in Germany? I mean, this has really been one of the, the big questions in, in recent weeks. Well, you know, this is um, a case where Germany is actually the, the dead weight, if you will. Um, it's the country that stands to lose the most if there is an embargo. And it's also probably the, the economy that cannot um, react to a sudden and total embargo on Russian oil. Um, I mean, we're talking about a, a major recession. You know, if you look at what's on Twitter today, I think they're saying mi- millions of, of Germans could lose their jobs if that were to happen, and that would happen this year. Um, so there's there's the German element, and Germany has to be on board for this to work. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, she knows that, and this whole notion of Western unity right now is going to be tested most by what is decided on regarding Russian oil going to Germany. So it's going to be make it's make or break. And here in Germany, I think the feeling is um, we just don't we don't know which way Germany is going to go. Mm-hmm. Or the only person who has been rather clear mind from the beginning that has been Habe. Um, and he's been saying things that are very uncomfortable for a politician, but he's, he's you know, someone has to tell the truth and um, saying, you know, that if we do have a sudden embargo, we're talking about a massive um, economic shock, um, a homemade shock. And we have to, you know, ask ourselves, are we willing to do that to ourselves for the sake of principle? And uh, it, so far, he hasn't gotten an answer, um, or at mm-hmm. least a majority. And I, I don't. I still think the jury is out on that. There is so much pressure right now on Brussels to go slow with this. Um, they, Germany wants time, and yet everyone else um, wants this to go faster. I mean, it's interesting. You've got Poland, for example, wanting to accelerate this. Germany pulling back. I mean, these roles are reversed um, com- compared to the other issues we've seen in the European Union. I mean, so um, Germany is really is the wild card here. And who would have thought just a year ago that that would be the case? But um, Germany's economic f- future is now completely tied to the future of European unity regarding. Russia, but also to maybe the, the survival of Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's well, a lot. I mean, 
It's a lot. It is. It is a lot, and and it it seems you know from what I've been been seeing, and and you're much closer to this, that it's not as if there's there's one German position. Um, I was surprised over the over the weekend um, to see a, a big headline in in the Bild Zeitung, um, which read "Schadet uns kein Gas boycott am Ende sogar mehr?" Fragezeichen. Um, yeah. Wouldn't we be impacted more? Um, if we don't introduce a gas boycott. Um, and then, you know, there's been, since you mentioned Habeck, um, there has been some interesting polling recently um, along party lines mm -hmm. of how people feel about um, an, an immediate boycott of Russian oil and gas. And interestingly enough, 71% of Greens are in favor um, 56% of, of social Democrats, 55% of, of Christian Democrats, the, the free Democrats are a little bit lower. The AFD is, is way off the scale. Um, mm. but it's, it's kind of ironic that 71% of the greens, um, are in favor of an immediate energy embargo or would, would support an immediate energy embargo. And yet that's something that minister Habeck is not you know, moving forward with and actually yeah. has been opposed to. Well, I mean, that's been the story of of, of this government. The, the Greens in a position that um, is almost in, you know, is the anathema to everything that they've stood for or that they said they were going to stand for. And now they're in power and having to make maybe decisions that um, they would have never stood by just a few months ago. And um, the the CDU is just waiting to attack that, but um, you know, the CDU, they also, they're just as culpable um, because the, the whole energy dependency problem that we have now um, was made possible with 16 years of CDU leadership. And um, that's something that, you know, that's that this big elephant in the room too, that no one wants to talk about is how did, how did the, the country, this, economic giant allow itself to be put into th this situation. And um, that's part of the equation here is, uh, as well. The CDU is embarrassed. Um, the Greens are maybe estranged from themselves in, in this situation. And the Social Democrats, you know, they're afraid that people are gonna think that they're, you know, closet, you know, Putinist. Um, right. And there's good reason for people to think that, you know, there's good reason for people right. to think that. I mean, it, it has been interesting sort of over the last few days um, following following Twitter and, and following statements by different members of the Bundestag. Um, you know, you've, you've seen people like Jürgen Trittin from the Greens, but then even um, Christian Democrats like Norbert Röttgen um, or Paul Tsimiak um, who have been far more outspoken um, about a, a energy embargo vis-a-vis um, -vis, vis -vis Russia. And it's, it's really cut across um, party lines. You know, you've, you've got some prominent free Democrats um, who are in the mix as well. Um, what's kind of conspicuous through its, through its absence is that there are not a lot of social Democrats who have been as outspoken um, about about the potential of an energy embargo, and and so you're you're really yeah, seeing I mean, the division. I think too that's maybe because a lot of people aren't aren't convinced that these sanctions are going to work to begin with. So mm -hmm. um, if you know, if you don't believe in the power of the sanctions to stop Vladimir Putin, then why would you um, put yourself through this crisis, this energy crisis? I mean, that, mm -hmm. I think that's the, the thinking here, and I think a lot of people are thinking that on um, the. The Greens, I think, are in the minority um, when it comes to maybe, you know, thinking of the longer term um, potential or not potential uh, of these sanctions. And it, it is it is a valid point. Um, if you ask any um, politician all the way up to Ursula von der Leyen about the power of sanctions to reverse Vladimir Putin's course, you know, you're going to get an answer that is is just it's it's weak, and you know mm -hmm. because everything has changed. Russia has China, 
Russia has India buying its oil now. I mean, the, the, the calculus is not the same as it would have been in 2014, for example. Um, and the power of the United States um, also seems diminished in this. You've got the militarization of Europe also being thrown into it. So there, there, there's all of these, um, these sudden unknowns that are part mm -hmm. of um, the, the thinking. And um, no one is convinced that, um, or very few are convinced that that one plus two will be three when it comes to sanctions. And I mean, there is a, you know, there, there is an argument there. Um, you're going to have to have patience and you're going to have to have a lot of um, endurance. Mm -hmm. And the Ukrainians are going to have to have a lot of endurance too. If, if they make it that long, you know, that's another thing. I mean, the law of diminishing returns will set in at some point if, if chemical weapons are, are used and, um, if there is a, a new uh, attack um, through yeah. the east of, of Ukraine, I mean, it, things could get really bad really quickly. And then what good are the sanctions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there have been, um, you know, a, a number of analyses about the, the negative economic impact um, yeah. of an embargo um, and that it would really have a, a tremendous impact on the German economy. Yeah. Um, but there have also been some analyses that I've seen um, where some economists have said, it's not gonna be easy, but this is still the right thing to do. And with you know measures like Quitzabite, um, yeah. it's something that we could do. And we have a certain, certain moral obligation yeah. um, to yeah. stop funding Putin's Putin's war. Yeah, I mean, um, there are some economists who say there would only be a three percent drop in GDP if it were mm -hmm. done correctly. But I mean, we can't even you know you can't even um, get people to agree on, on having a speed limit on the elder bonds right now right. Um, as, a, as a way of, of conserving energy. I mean, it's um, it's it's hard to get um, consensus right now, or to know what the consensus is. I mean, right. I. You know, they're, and they're even asking people, you know, turn your thermostat down um, going into next fall and next winter. You know, I mean, they, that's just not something that is convincing as a, a way of, you know, setting policy that's going to save the country's um, energy needs. But, but I, I guess it is sort of a sense of, of empowerment, if you will, that everybody can do a little bit. I mean, one yeah. of our, our guests last week um, got on and had a thick sweater on and I asked how he was doing and, and he said he was fine, but that you know, in his house, they've really turned the heat way down because they're yeah. trying to conserve as, as much as they can. And so I think mm -hmm. for, for a lot of people, there's a sense of if, if we can do a little bit, I mean, we're not suffering as much sure. as the people in Ukraine are. Uh, sure. But if we can do a little bit, we can we can help. Yeah. Um, re related to to sort of this economic dimension, though, one of our our viewers um, just just submitted the following question: Since Germany is the largest economy in the EU, what would a German recession mean for other member states, including countries like Poland, which mm -hmm. are pushing the embargo? Well, it, that's a good question. I mean, um, Germany is the most important trading partner um, to Poland outside of, if you're, you know, if you're looking at within the European Union, apart from China and the United States. Right. So if, if Germany in the EU, if Germany has um, a, a recession, let's say a drop of GDP three, four percent, that will be felt across the entire EU with, without a doubt. Um, but it, I mean, it could it could be asymmetric um, in, in in what it looks like, and maybe Spain would not feel it as hard as Poland. It's it's hard um, it's hard to know. Uh, but to say that the EU would come out relatively unscathed, you know, I, that's I think that's wishful thinking. You know, you have inflation, and, and the inflation um, element that we're all dealing with is something that. Um, the, the European Central Bank, you know, Christine Lagarde, she's not convinced that the ECB can um, tackle it alone. And, you know, across the pond, the Fed, they're also 
um, worry that they're going to do too much or do too little or in, that it could run away from them. I mean, if that happens, you know, you have that added on to uh, um, an energy shock. Uh, you know, you, it could be a, a disaster of epic proportions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, and it, this is all homemade, you know, and it, it's right. like when we, when we had the lockdown with the pandemic, I, you know, people, I think, are, are feeling the sense of deja vu. We shut down the economy two years ago. And now we're talking about, you know, putting ourselves into another um, state of stasis, if you will. Um, and that, that, that's a lot to ask people um, to do. And it's, um, it's hard for a lot of people to get their heads around it um, in the it, span of it, it two is. and a half years. Mm-hmm. Brent, it, it is a lot to ask, but I think yep. anybody um, you know, who takes a step back for a moment would say that these are kind of extenuating circumstances where the global yep. economy has had two major shocks to the system that were not anticipated. The, the COVID pandemic and this war in Ukraine have, have really upended um, our, our economy. Um, and the, you know, think just think about global supply chains um, and yep. how disruptive yep. they've been through both of these both of these things, um, and now concerns about food security yeah. because of the fact that both Ukraine and, and Russia have been the, the breadbasket. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I I would hope. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. This is a lot to ask of people, particularly after seventy years of of peace and prosperity in in yeah. Europe. Um, but these, it seems to me that this is really a, a, a special situation given these two now simultaneous crises that we have mm. that are that are unfolding. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the if you want to find the silver lining in this, the good thing that could maybe come out of this is that this will accelerate the move to a decarbonized global economy. And mm. um, that will be a benefit to our children and our children's children. Um, that's that. That's good, and maybe it, maybe it takes a a double whammy or triple whammy to get the world um, to where it needs to be by 2040, 2050. I mean, that's one way of, of looking at, it. and that's the way I try to keep you know thinking. Maybe that's where we're we're headed. We're being forced um, for our own good to go, um, where we're actually going to save ourselves. In the end. So, I mean, I, Brent, I think, I think you're right. I mean, this has obviously been a tremendous catalyst for moving forward with renewables um, in a in a way that that you know we we need to move much more rapidly than than we have in the past. Yeah. Um, but having said that, you know, there are no quick fixes, and mm-hmm. these things take time. Um, even just the notion of building two LNG terminals in in That's northern right. Germany, this is a, a multi year process. That's right. And not something that can that can happen overnight. And yet the yeah. the situation that we're in right now um, is is pretty pretty dire um, yeah. and needs an immediate response. Yeah. I don't know if you saw um, the the piece by Paul Krugman that came out um, I guess on Friday or or Saturday, but he was very critical um, of of Germany and and put his criticism of Germany in the context of. Um, what Germany demanded of Greece um, yeah. in the debt crisis, and right. that um, basically, you know, G- Germany said that Greece needed to do some belt tightening and, and needed to to get its act together um, in order to make it through a crisis. And here we are, sort of in a in a very different situation, but one where Germany is really sort of being called upon um, mm-hmm. to have um, some. Um, midterm pain, pain. for um, long-term um, fiscal health and for um, a you know a, a for taking the moral high ground when it comes to yeah. to the war in Ukraine. How has has that debate been playing out at all in Germany? Making a no. comparison between <clears throat> no, I mean you know that's it's a good good point. Um, because you know, Schäuble doesn't say much these days. Merkel is gone. And, um, you know, the great V man from Greece, you know, you see him on television, but you, um, now and then, but you just don't, you don't, the people who really were part of that, that era, 
are, are, are no longer in power or no longer present. And, um, but it, it, it's a valid point. It's a valid point. Um, and, and I think too, and you know, you could be very critical of Germany and say, you know, you you know what you have to do, you know it's going to hurt, but you are dragging your feet, and even the smallest things, such as a speed limit on your autobahns, you can't do, and, and you come up with an excuse that we don't have enough signs. I mean, there are all mm -hmm. these re ridiculous um, stumbling blocks that they're putting in the way, and I'm sure yeah, the Greeks looking at it are thinking, you know, you, you can't take your own medicine, but that said, still, um, you know, the Germans know that what they're doing, no one's going to bail them out. Mm -hmm. And um, that in, in the case with Greece, you know, there was the threat of maybe them leaving the um, Eurozone. But um, I, I don't think that anyone thought 100% that Germany was willing to just drop them or, or let them, you know, have to deal with their own fate. And, and, and I think Germans are aware that, um, you know, they're the, they're the only game in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, when, they, when they start to stumble, there will be no one to come um, yeah. and, and bail them out. So, I mean, that's also a valid point that, um, that we have to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I mean, you're you're absolutely right, and I guess the the hope would be that um, that that Germany would feel that it could do the belt tightening that's necessary in order to make it through make it through this this phase. Yeah, Brad. Of course, the other you know the other big issue when it comes to to Ukraine has been questions around military support, and it seems clear that that Ukraine needs heavy weapons. Um, this has been something that that President Zelensky has been asking for over and over again. Um, today, I, I heard Anadina Babak speaking, and, and she was on the periphery of the, the EU foreign minister meeting, and she was saying that weapon deliveries are absolutely necessary um, and went so far as to say this is not a time for excuses, but a time for creative and pragmatic solutions. Um, mm -hmm. And well, yet, you know, Germany seems to be kind of slow rolling or delaying the delivery of, of some of its, right. its military hardware. Um, can can you talk to us a little bit about what's what's behind that? I mean, why why isn't Germany more forthcoming with its with the military hardware at least? Yeah, well, I mean, maybe maybe there's not that much um, to send to Ukraine to begin with. Um, maybe I think I think that is a point. I think what we're seeing too it, it, this this situation is uh, forcing the emperor to everyone to see that he doesn't have any clothes. The, the German military has been neglected fiscally for years now. And, you know, there've been jokes, you know, about the, the um, guns that couldn't shoot straight in, in the desert, but that's a fact. I mean, uh, this is a military that it ha is just ill equipped. And, and the notion that they can just send all of these hard weapons to Ukraine, maybe you're asking too much of Germany um, at this moment. I, a lot of people are saying, you know, stop asking Germany to give you the weapons and tell them to just write the check um, because that's what Germany can do. Um, and the, there are people who are saying, you know, that's what that would be easier to do as well. Um, that would also um, appease people who are against selling weapons to begin with or giving weapons away. Um, but I, I think in this case, Germany is being, um, it, it's just, it's beyond at its capacity right now in what it um, can deliver and also in what it wants to deliver. I mean, Annalena Baerbach says you know, that, but I mean, this it, they've gone through a 180 change in the span of less than two months. Um, and and, and they've, you know, they've said, okay, we're going to have a fund earmarked 100, what was it, 100 billion euros um, just for the military. I mean, th these are huge, huge um, changes. And they're also going into debt, which, you know, for, for Germans is, you know, that's, that's the cardinal sin. So all these mm -hmm. things are taking place. 
Um, but I, I think, you know, and this is what I've also heard from the people that I talk with who um, are our Bundeswehr experts. And they just say, you know, truth be told, we just, um, we can't man up right now and give them what they need. The Brits came. I mean, one of one of one of the things that I, I sort of saw in the periphery over the weekend was that that Germany had made a commitment of, of delivering something like 500 tanks, um, yeah. but that these tanks needed to be retrofitted in order to bring them up to to standard, um, yeah. and that that would take time, and yeah. that the other option you know would be to take um, tanks that are currently being used by the Bundeswehr yeah. and send them immediately. Um, to Ukraine so that they could be put into to action um, yeah. on the front lines. But that that would then, of course, leave the Bundeswehr um, yeah. even less well-equipped yeah, than it already. And that there's a you, tremendous amount of reluctance, reluctance you there. Yeah, you won't get, so you won't, I, I don't think you'll get support for that at all. Um, I, I think that, I think at the end of the day, there will be some type of check writing that takes place yeah. um, because they just, um, they don't, they're, they're not, a, you know, they're not a military power, power. And, you know, they now they say that they, they want to become more of a military power, which is um, ironically what Donald Trump spent four years saying they should be doing. Um, but, you know, this also doesn't happen quickly. Yeah. Uh, so th these are all things that um, require time. And um, I don't know if the dy dynamics of war in the Donbass um, are going to follow that time schedule. Mm -hmm. That's what is so scary. Yeah, uh, Brent. One of our one of our viewers is is interested in in public sentiment and asks yeah. um, whether the German press is presenting the Russian invasion and the Russian atrocities. Uh, differently from press in other countries in the EU, or, or whether it's more or less the same. Um, and how, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming um, sort of how the German public is responding to the kinds of images that we've all seen from yeah. Bucha or Bucha. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the viewer is, is curious whether there's still a, a fairly large pro-Russian element in Germany's press um, and whether this is having a, an impact on public opinion in Germany. You know, um, I'll give you an example of what happened last last um, Thursday or Friday with Bucha. Um, the correspondent for ARD in the Tagesschau said that, um, you know, reported that there they had found this, this mass graves, there were corpses on, on the streets, but that um, the entire town had been cordoned off and reporters weren't able to go and verify it themselves. Now, he said that while reporters from CNN, for example, were doing live shots from right there where the bodies were. And um, he claims that he was misunderstood in the live shot in, in what he said, but um, we know what he said. And, and I, I, think, I think this speaks maybe to the, um, maybe there, there is maybe a reluctance to push the story um, knowing that it's going to lead you to the abyss and when it comes to, um, to Russia. And I, um, it's hard to explain, but there, there is, compared to what you would see in the U.S., what you would see in the U.K. or, or Poland, there is a significant amount of um, sympathy for Russia here. I'm not saying for Vladimir Putin. But mm -hmm. the, out, the outrage that we have seen in the U.S. media, for example, um, we have not seen in the media here. We have, mm -hmm. unless, you know, maybe build side to but, you know, build, you know, is not the barometer of what's truth. Um, right. But, but I, I just, I haven't, I haven't felt that there has been this outrage, um, especially on television. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost it's almost like they're it's almost like Vietnam was for the Americans reporting it. You know, it's just each day is the new, latest installment, and that's what it feels like sometimes watching the news here, um, the, the the German news. I mean, I mean, there are people, of course, who would shoot me for saying that, but that's just that's the feeling that I get when I watch that um, 
the I may also their, their their way of journalism you know they don't like any pathos they they don't want to um sensationalize it which i i appreciate and understand but um you know when you see mass graves that were created in the span of two three weeks um yeah if you can't have outrage then when can you yeah and i mean it's it's pretty shocking and and I certainly think, you know, that, that, that this has the potential to really shape public sentiment. But if the public is yeah. not really getting the facts, then that's that's problematic. Um, yeah. Brent, in, in terms of, of sort of putting things into a broader context, um, mm -hmm. about a week ago, it was fairly widely reported that that former German Chancellor Angela Merkel um, defended her 2008 decision to block Ukraine from joining NATO at that time. And, um, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, um, Germany's energy dependence on Russia um, have raised some questions about, about Merkel's legacy. Um, yeah. And I'd be really interested in, in hearing from you sort of how Russia's invasion and, and everything that that's brought with it um, might have an impact on, on Merkel's legacy. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's going to have a devastating impact on her, her legacy. Um, but I, I thought this even before the invasion began. What I've mm -hmm. noticed is we've, re we've reported, we've asked these questions about, about especially, especially her role and how complicit she was in enabling the Putin war machine to, um, to exist. And um, we, most of the time, I, I felt like we were an outlier. There's a reporter with Politico who um, is who's excellent. He's actually been on, on, on my show a couple of times, um, who has also been asking really hard questions. Um, and he says, and he's shown a, a couple of tweets to prove it, that um, he'll have a scathing article about the role of the CDU or Merkel, and then Two days later, in the FAZ or the Süddeutsche Zeitung, there will be an article that almost mimics or reflects what he, the sentiment of what he's said, and then that is reported as maybe this, um, this almost this epiphany that well, you know, maybe you know, Muti was not such a good Muti after all. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's been this reluctance, but I also feel there's been the reluctance to be outraged over Gerhard Schroeder um, and his role in this. I mean, I, the distance, there, there's, there's this very clinical, sterile distance um, put between the people in power, the political elite, and I think also the public and their former chancellors who should be statesmen or states people. Mm -hmm. um, and they they just it's as if they don't want to touch the, those people from the past anymore um and i, I it's hard to get my head around gerhard mm -hmm. schroeder i mean what he has done and what he continues to do um and he he just doesn't get taken to task as much as i would expect mm -hmm. um to happen here and with Miracle, Miracle did defend her decision. That's true last week. But other than that, the only other story about Miracle since she left office was that a couple of weeks ago, she was shopping at, I think it was the Lidl grocery store here in Mitta. Bodyguards were with her and she was in the supermarket and someone still managed to walk up and um, steal her purse and take it out of the grocery store. And then when wow. they got it, out they opened her wallet and realized it was angela Merkel, and they brought it back to the grocery store and gave it back to her i mean that i mean okay that's a funny story but that's that's really the only time she has been in the media here and mm -hmm. everything now i mean everything that this country and that europe is facing um is directly connected to decisions she made and policies she made and um, you know, her refusal to stop Nord Stream 2 or her being the Putin whisperer or her um, insisting that 
Germany have to pursue economic ties with China um, and not endanger those in order to pursue a foreign policy based on human rights. All of these, all of you know, these years of, of her leadership are now coming home to roost in some very ugly ways. And um, not many people are asking her to take responsibility for anything. I, um, it, it's, it's a very strange dynamic, I think, that um, and it, all, it could be also that they're just overwhelmed with what's going on and there's no time to maybe blame people, but I don't know if it's so much as blaming as trying to understand how it happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we reported many times with that um, Merkel was the Putin whisperer, you know, Barack Obama treasured her because she was kind of a window into the Kremlin for him. Yeah. And um, um, now, you know, you look back, you think, well, you know, maybe she should have been tougher with him or maybe, um, you know, maybe her, she was known for just Merkeling, you know, just kind of watching and letting things go. Maybe um, she shouldn't have done that with um, mm -hmm. Putin. Um, mm -hmm. at Nord Stream 2, she really should not have. I mean, that remains a mystery to many people. Why? You know, she even got Joe Biden to change his mind about slapping sanctions on companies yeah. that were connected to the construction of the pipeline because he didn't want to jeopardize the relationship with Germany. Yeah. Um, bizarre. Well, and, and I think, I think you know, in terms of Biden's rationale, it was because there was recognition that um, the U.S. needed Germany for other things yeah. like, like China. Yep. Um, the, you know, the, the other issue that I don't think you've mentioned, but that one of our, our viewers mentioned, and, and that certainly fits on that list is Merkel's decision to draw down nuclear power, um, by the end of this year. Um, you know, that certainly has contributed to putting, putting Germany in the bind that it's currently in. Yep. Um, but since you, you mentioned China, um, I, I have one more question before we maybe move on to something else. Um, and, and that is. You know, my perennial question at the moment is, is whether the debate that we're seeing unfold um, in Germany about its Russlandpolitik and about mm -hmm. questions like Wandel through Handel and yeah. um, the, the you know, perennial debate about interdependence between Russia and, and Germany. Um, and all of this is being called into question now in a, in a really big way. Has that unleashed um, a new debate about Germany's ties with China as well? Um, you know, obviously the relationship between Germany and China is very different from the relationship between, between Germany and Russia, um, but there is significant mutual dependence there as well. Huge, and huge. Germany, yeah. and, and, and Germany has not been as outspoken no. about some of the, the big issues like human rights that you talk right. about. Right. I mean, it, it's huge. You can't, I mean, they, you know, Germany and China are each other's most important trading partners. Mm -hmm. And um, you, there is no one in corporate Germany or in the Communist Party in China who wants to um, endanger that right now. Um, and there's just too much at stake. And at the same time, you've got China you know, standing with Vladimir Putin. So, you know, here you are doing business with, you know, this, this guy who is, you know, hanging out with your arch nemesis as well. Um, I, but again, this is a, a constellation that is somewhat homemade um, mm -hmm. through and it's not like they weren't warned. You know, I will say the Greens, you know, warned many years that this was the wrong way. Um, and, they, you know, maybe they were right, but here we are. Um, you know, the Americans are no different. The Americans are also in bed or have been in bed um, with the Chinese. And now um, the threat of all of this interdependence ending and this bifurcation of the global economy um, yeah, Germany stands to be one of the biggest losers if that happens, mm -hmm. without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and, uh, and 
you know, no one expects there to be another Marshall Plan for Europe if this um, great dividing of the global economy takes place. And, and I think mm -hmm. the Germans are, are well aware of that. So, so Brent, as we wrap up, I'd like to come back to sort of German domestic politics, if you will. I mean, obviously, the, the war in Ukraine is a huge stress test um, for governments around the world, for countries around the world. It's certainly been a stress test for the relatively young government coalition. Um, but things seem particularly shaky um, for the coalition at the moment, not only related to the differences of opinion that we've already talked about when it comes to Ukraine, um, whether it's the delivery of weapons or whether it's um, the, the energy embargo. Um, but, you know, two ministers um, have been, or there have been calls for the resignation of two ministers uh, in, in recent days. One is the defense minister, um, Frau Lambrecht, and the other is the, the Familien minister, um, Frau Spiegel. Uh, yeah. which just came up over the weekend. Um, and that was related to the, the floods last year and, and the fact that she was on vacation at the time. Um, yeah. But I think almost more importantly, um, the coalition seems to be in, in some difficulty over its, its COVID policy and seems to be losing public trust. Um, the government wanted to introduce a COVID vaccine mandate, um, yeah. which granted, you know, hardly any country has done. Um, but on, on Thursday last week, the Bundestag rejected not just one, but several motions in favor of, of right. compulsory vaccination. That's right. And um, it, it seems clear um, that the, the coalition government just didn't have the, the majority, largely because a lot of FDP politicians were, were balking at the proposal. Mm -hmm. They've been counting on support from the CDU, CSU, um, but that support did not come through. Yep. And now we've already seen some some tensions between Olaf Scholz um, and his his health minister Karl yeah. Lauterbach, um, when Scholz said that there would not be another attempt to introduce a, a vaccine mandate, which Lauterbach had had hinted at um, after mm -hmm. the after the defeat. Um, can can you? I mean, I know that there's a lot there, and I, I know we don't have a ton of time to go into the the, the COVID policy, but. What's what's your sense of the public trust um, in in the government at the moment? Zero, zero, zero. I think people I think people think I think people look at the government and the fact that last week that they were wheeling and dealing about okay let's do a um, a, a mandate for fifty and over sixty and over or people just in the healthcare profession. I mean you know you can't wheel and deal science right. And that's what was right. happening. And I mean, there you completely lose your credibility. And that's exactly what happened. And then you had um, Lauterbach last week also um, on um, Markus Lantz late at night saying that, um, announcing that there would be no quarantine, I think, for people who tested positive. Um, and then he had to walk that back. And um, it was just shocking that this is Mr. Impflicht saying that mm -hmm. if you test positive, you don't even have to be in quarantine or you don't have to um, stay home. Um, so they, it, it just seems like they, they don't know what they're doing and that they themselves don't know which science to follow. So that's mm -hmm. why when you go now, you know, there are, there are no more mask mandates when you go shopping. But if you go shopping um, here in the grocery stores, everyone still has their mask on. That speaks, I think, um, louder than anything. Mm -hmm. So again, sort of people are taking um, taking things into their their own hands. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the numbers are not are not dreadful, right? I mean, seventy six percent of people in Germany have had two vaccines. Um, Fifty nine percent have had a third vaccination. Um, yeah. But I think that the the most difficult issue for for Germany to address is this sort of constant 24% of the population that has not been fully protected and that does not seem to be interested in, in getting fully protected. Yeah. And plus, you know, the demographics, you know, Germany has a lot of people who are over the age of 70 and over the age of 80. Um, so you just, you, the, the, um, any variant here hits harder than it would somewhere like in the US um, where your demographics are, are younger, skew younger. And um, yeah. that, that's part of the calculus here 
as well. And um, I think the healthcare industry is also so um, overburdened. I think that's part of the reason why people, people are afraid to go to the emergency room. Um, and with good reason, you know, yesterday in the Tiger Spiegel, there was a, um, these reports from people, um, nurses, doctors, um, just their accounts from what their shifts have been like recently. And I mean, these are like tales from the crypt. Um, and this is in one of the world's most advanced um, medical economies where, you know, you just, you don't want to go now um, because they could, they could, because they're so overwhelmed and understaffed. If you have an emergency, you could go there and be neglected and die because that's mm-hmm. happened. That's happening almost every day. And um, so that also comes into people's thinking. I've heard that, I think more from people than them saying that the politicians don't know what they're doing. People are just afraid for their own, own health if they do get sick, um, that they won't be able to get the attention and the health care that they need as, as quickly as they need it. That's the real fear right now. Maybe maybe just one one quick follow-up to that. Sure. Um, and and that is, you know, there I did see a Deutschland trend survey um, that showed that the majority of supporters of the CDU, CSU, SPD, and Greens are in yep. favor of a mandate, which is actually good news, right? That the public seems to be supportive of it. But if then the Bundestag is not voting in favor, um, I'm sure that that also sort of eats away the trust and confidence that that people have um, in the political system, right? In democratic institutions and, and practices, because it's not representing their interests. It's not representing their interests. And then look, look at what you're seeing um, you know, in Hungary with Viktor Orban, he just won. Um, and you've got a runoff now between um, Le Pen and Macron in France, and the you know there's also the um, the powers that be in Poland. They haven't gone anywhere, so there, there's this feeling that um, yeah maybe that that governments aren't doing what they're supposed to be. That there is this fundamental breakdown that 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 we're witnessing. That maybe it's also being accelerated by. The, um, the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Um, but all of this comes together. And, I, and, I, and I'll say this too, Steve, I think a lot of people here, when they talk, when you talk about democracy to them, um, and you say, you, you know, you hold up the United States as leader of the free world, you know, they kind of, ju- they just go, get, you know, what are you going to do in two years for us? There's this mm-hmm. real fear, cynical fear, that in two years, something like Trump may reappear in America, and then what? what, what what's your yeah. going to do? Um, and that's an existential fear. And, um, you know, there are no, there's no easy answer to give people right now. Well, Brent, I'm, I'm sorry to end on, on such a pessimistic <laughs> note. Yeah, um, I know. I but, but, you know, this has been um, just a, a fascinating conversation, and I really want to thank you for for taking the time to, to talk sure. with us. I, I feel like we were really able to unpack a, a number of issues. Um, unfortunately, we did not get to the French election, which you touched on at the very end there. Um, but I would be delighted to, to have you back at some point in the coming months sure. um, and, sure. and look forward to, to staying in touch with you. So, so yeah. thank you again yeah. for, for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. It's good to see you again, too.